I don't really know how I got into sound health. I just think it got into me. I had always had this uh, very odd hearing and uh, vocal abilities, and I just thought everybody did. It, I thought everybody could hear sounds and know what people were thinking and know what the plants were thinking. And I think everything in the universe has a sound, and I think I'm just hearing it. It's much like what they wrote about Pythagoras, that everything had a sound, every rock, every person, every cup, every everything. So they had this whole free program for the community, and you can go in and have your hearing tested. And I'm sitting in this little soundproof room with these headphones on, and they put a ring in there and a ring in there, and you lift your hand and you do this. And this guy came in this little soundproof room, and he said, what are you hearing? Your hearing is off the scale. And I couldn't really describe what I was hearing. I said, okay, I'll just, I'll just make a sound for you. I'll do it for you. And so I did one of these sounds, and he's standing there, and the next thing I know, he's just, he's losing his balance and falling in the floor. He was a student of martial arts, and he was really interested in samurai warriors, and he had high blood pressure. And what he, what the sound had done to him was drop his blood pressure. And he said, I don't know what you just did, but it had an effect on me. And I think what you've discovered or what's really happening is you just did a sound that the samurai warriors did right before they attacked an opponent. And it was, the sound was designed to reduce the blood pressure of the opponent. So it'd be easier to overcome them. There are frequencies that influence you and could influence your blood pressure. So if they could influence your blood pressure, why couldn't they influence something else? And that was the beginning of looking at the scientific side of it and trying to quantify what was happening with my ears. From there, I started listening to people's sounds. We would record them with the stuff that was too high, needed to come down. When people had a headache, they had a big spike. And if we would give them that sound that was spiked, we could make their headache worse. But if we would give them the reciprocal of that sound, like color complements, red and green are opposites. So if they had a sound that was 130 cycles, which is the no color of red and the note of C, we could give them that opposite note, color green, note of F sharp, and we could take their headaches away. And we could change their blood pressure. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was just looking to see what I could find. But what we birthed, I think, was a new science. Right now, we're just a science that people see a lot of potential, called a proto-science. People see a lot of potential for anti-aging, for help with autism, for help with recovery from stroke, with regrowth of nerves, with having the potential to look at a toxin or a pathogen and just almost instantly from your voice know an antidote. So this stuff about bird flu being an issue and this is gonna be this great pandemic, if we could have computers set every place where there's the potential to, to see this, we could catch it before it became pathogenic. And by that I mean when you get a cold, you get exposed to a cold or measles or whatever, it has an incubation period. That's when the genome of the pathogen enters your body, and then when it begins to set up housekeeping, it puts off proteins that make you sick. We can catch it in that genomic state from your voice. We can build an antidote, and then it doesn't have to go to that pathogenic stage. This is really not a new technology. As I was talking about Pythagoras, that's centuries ago. And I have to imagine that in the beginning, when people had babies, they sang to them. It's a natural thing to want to talk and interact with your babies. And it's a natural thing to moan and groan when you're ill. And it's a natural thing to wail with, with grief when somebody that you love died. So I think vocal expression was there from the beginning. Most of us already know this. You just didn't think about it. Young men's voice changed when they go through puberty. That's in response to a hormone. We just took it a couple of steps further and we look at your voice in response to genes and proteins and nutrients and toxins and pathogens and whatever else is going on in your environment. Other people, you respond to them. Even in Christianity, it says things like, in the beginning was the word, and the word is sound and sound is frequency. We are controlled by frequency. Our brain speaks math. We just happen to tap into that and we just made a science out of it. 
And it's in Christianity. When, when you look at a picture of Jesus, isn't there a whitish yellow aura around his head? That's your aura, A-U-R-A in English, O-R-A in Hebrew, meaning light. And that people give off light. Some people see this as an aura, so they have this visual intuition about the body. Some people hear it, and they have an oral intuition about what we're saying. And we found that these little micro tremors, all the little micro frequencies in the voice, all give us information about you. Tell us the architecture of, of the pattern of your voice tells us what's going on with you. You have vocal codes, and we just found a way to decode them because we found out that the vocal cords are controlled by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. That's in the parasympathetic nerve bundle that keeps your body in stasis, keeps it calm, cool, and collected, and doing what I gotta do. In that bundle is nerve fibers, nerve frequencies running all the time, a connection from your brain to your body. And in that bundle is control of the vocal cords. So the vocal cords have a direct connection, a direct link to the brain. And anything that happens to your brain, which is your central processing unit for everything that's going on, it goes through your vocal cords. And we just broke the codes. And this is definitely a new kind of medicine. I'm not allowed to say that because I'm not allowed to say it's a medicine. Actually, I think it's an old kind of medicine that we did it all along. There are still stories out about the Aborigines that sing a broken bone fix overnight or sing somebody well. It's on the planet. Somebody remembered it. It's in some of these ancient uh, indigenous cultures. We just brought it to science because we use computers. You know, I could do this with my voice from now till I die and people wouldn't believe it because it's only an esoteric talent that I have. But I knew that when I died, it was gonna die and it was too valuable to the human race not to put this in a system that somebody else could use and that we could teach easily to somebody else. So that's our hope for the future, that everyone learns to do this. And those people out front, the visionaries, they're the ones that say, yeah, this is where we ought to go. This is what we ought to do. You got these people back here that are saying, no, nah, there's nothing to that. It's just poppycock. They're the ones who won't look at it, or they're the ones that have their own agendas that they don't want something new coming along. Progress can only happen by accepting those things not in vogue at the moment. We were not in vogue in the beginning, but people are joining us every day and saying, yes, this is where we need to go. This is what I want to do. I want to be part of making a difference.